فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم So now he's going to speak about the etiquette that's needed from everybody towards the Quran. The man is that you should deal with the Quran in how should you respect the Quran? Naam. In his authentic book of Hadith, Muslim narrates that Tamim al Dari said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Religion is advice. They, those he was talking to, said, To whom? He said, To Allah, His book, His Messenger, the leaders of the Muslims, and the common folk. The scholars have stated that the advice to the book of Allah is to believe that it is the speech of Allah and that it is His revelation, that it does not resemble the speech of His creatures, it, of His creatures in any manner, and that if all the creatures were to gather together to preach anything like it, they would not be able to and fail. It also includes honoring it, reciting it as it should be recited, and reciting it beautifully, with humility, and by articulating its letters correctly. Further, it includes protecting it against the misinterpretation of deviants and transgressors. One must acknowledge as true everything, as true everything that it contains, abide by its rules, study its, scientists, it, study its sciences and parables, Take lessons from its admonitions, ponder in its wonders, carry out that which it is which is clear and obvious, and accept that which is not entirely clear to us. We must study it to differentiate between its general rules and its more specific ones, and to differentiate between the verses that abrogate and those that are abrogated. We must spread and teach its sciences and call to it, as well as call to everything we have mentioned that falls under advice to the Book of Allah. Section. Muslim scholars are unanimously agreed that it is obligatory to honor the glorious Quran completely and to raise it above any claims of imperfection and to raise it above any claims of imperfection and to preserve it. They are also unanimous in that whosoever rejects a single letter of it or deliberately adds a single letter to it, that it is not mentioned in any of the different readings. He is a disbeliever. You see how dangerous it is if a person, just a letter from the Quran, he drops it and says, Ah, oh, wallahi, let alone the person who says that the Quran is tampered with or its preservation needs to be questioned. This is a statement, Kufr bi ijma'i al ulama, there's no difference of opinion regarding it. Wa ajma'u ala anna man jahada minhu harfan. Anyone who st stubbornly and by hard headedness says, I reject this letter, mimma ujma' ali, which the scholars have unanimously agreed upon. Or he increases a letter. Or no one has ever read this. Or, and he knows this. For a kafir, he's a kafir. And then now he brings the ijma' that Al Imam Al Abu Al Fadl Qadi Iyad transmitted. And, he put, and his statement is of, of his is in his kitab Al Shifa Bi Hukuk Al Mustafa. Ijma' Lam Yakhtali Fi Itnan Min Al Muslimin. Two Muslims have never differed upon. The issue is very dangerous, man. This is because of the ta'wil. There's a man in the takfir. See, the issue of when you're doing it specifically on that person is different. Are you with me? But if the person is hukum am, the general ruling is that this is kufr. Billahi al al al-Azim. The Imam and Hafiz previously explained as being the highest rank among the scholars of hadith. Abdul Fadl al Qali Iyad, may Allah have mercy on him, once said, Listen to this kalam, wallahi, listen to this kalam, look how dangerous it is. Hey? He once said, One must know that whoever shows lack of respect towards the Quran. So pay, pay attention, he shows lack of respect towards the Quran. Hey? Lack of respect towards the Quran or the Mus'haf hey? or anything of it, uh -huh. or insults it or rejects a single letter of it, or denies any of its clear rulings or affirms that which Allah has negated or negates that which Allah has affirmed while being aware of his actions fully or doubts any of that affirmed by the Qur'an oh. is a oh, shakka, oh, shakka fi shay'in min dhalika or oh, he doubts anything regarding the Qur'an so you know what, I don't know man, these letters I doubt whether these words are preserved and they were brought correctly to us 
فهو كافر باجماع المسلمين he is a disbeliever according to the consensus of muslims انا لله وان is it just this quran no not just the quran even torah and injil look at this are you likewise if one rejects the torah the torah or the gospel or any of the revealed books of allah or to disbelieves in them he says i don't believe in torah torah no i don't believe in it at all Meaning, believe the, 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 believing in it here means what? Sorry, disbelieving in it that, it, that Torah doesn't exist. What? Torah? La, 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 la. Not affirming it's, 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 it's like it's been the fact that it was God's words one time and it was a rules and regulation that were followed. You see? Same with the Torah. Same with Injil. Doesn't mean that he follows it now. Well, he can't follow it now anymore. It's abrogated. Are you with me? And the preservation of those books, now we question it. Are you there, brothers? It, ha it has been tampered with. As Allah told us, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَةِ عَمَّ وَاضِعِهِ But I believe in those books. I believe in Torah. I believe in Torah. And I believe in Injil. And I also believe in other books that Allah has sent down, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I can't disbelieve in them. If I do disbelieve in them, or I insult the Torah, or I insult the Injil, or I belittle it, what does he say? For what? Or disbelieves in them, or insults them, or shows disrespect towards them. He is a disbeliever. Listen to this. He's a disbeliever. This is consensus. This is not difference of opinion amongst the scholars. When the Prophet ﷺ, they came to him and they, they wanted the Prophet to make a judge between them. And what book did they bring to the Prophet? What did he do to the Torah? He put it on top of a pillow. He brought a pillow, alayhi salatu he put the pillow on the floor and then he put the Torah on top of the pillar. The Prophet did that. Are you there, brothers? And sometimes in places like Hyde Park and other places, you see Muslims swaving the Bible like that, all over the place, just like that. Are you there? I remember one time I watched Hyde Park, one guy took his finger and took the Bible and was doing this to the Bible. It's a problem. It goes against the nostrils of the textual evidence and the proofs that we believe in. Are you with me, brothers? You have to respect these people's books. It's their book, they believe in it. They hold on to it. So when you're dealing, a person whose book you did this to, how are you going to give him deen? What religion is he going to take from you? Sah? They ain't going to accept nothing from you. And that, that opens the people to do something to your book, right? And on. He continues. The Muslims are also unanimously agreed that the Quran being recited all over the world. Are you pay attention? The, the Quran look, being recited. This is the kalam still of who? The kalam of Abil Fadl Qadi Riyadh. Hey, he says he goes and work. Written, recited all over the world, written in Mus'haf, seen in the hands of Muslims and encompassed between two covers, starting with Al-Fatiha and ending with and ending with the end of Al-Nas in the speech of Allah and the revelation he revealed to his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are also agreed that everything in the Quran contains truth and that, sorry, that everything the Qur'an contains is the truth and that anyone deliberately de deleting a letter of it or exchanging one letter for another or adding a letter to it that, that, is, not in of the, that is not in the Mus'hafs that the scholars have unanimously agreed upon or attributes to it that which the scholars have agreed is not of the Qur'an and does all of this knowingly, he is a disbeliever. Inna lillahi wa He's a what? Ya yeah, Akhi, if the ijma is mun'aqid like that, would you even need to, uh, would you need to go and check in if the Qur'an is preserved or not? Do you need to? Don't need to. You don't need to even check the preservation of the Qur'an. The ijma of the ummah is mun'aqid, ya Akhi. The rafid alayhi la'ain Allah, they're the only ones who went against uh, us in the Qur'an's preservation. One of their shuyukhs, his name is called Tabarsi. Tabarsi, right? He came and he authored a book. And guess what he called it? He called it Taharifu Fasul Khitab fi Taharifi Ayy al Arbab. Something like that. Fasul Khitab. Fasul Khitab means that this is the distinguishing statement that what Allah's speech is abrig uh, sorry, it's distorted. Allah's words, the Quran is distorted. This is where it, this is where Walidalik ibn Hazm he, in his Kitab al-Fisal fi al-Milal wa al-Ahwa'i wa al-Nihal, he mentioned that a man came up to him, a Jew man, and he argued with him, or a Christian, somebody, and he argued with him. And then Imam ibn Hazm rahimahullah said to him that you, the Bible, we don't believe it's preserved. We believe it's distorted. 
and the Yahudi or I think it was Yahudi or Christian, I don't know which one it was, he said to Ibn Hazm, you guys also believe that the Quran is distorted. And he said, who said that? So he brought him some statements of the Raf and the Shia. And then Al Imam Ibn Hazm said, how are kuffar? These guys are kuffar, they're not Muslims. Their kalam has no hujjah for us. Abu Uthman ibn Haddad states, all those, who, all those who are upon the path of Tawheed, Islamic monotheism, have agreed that whoever rejects a letter of the Qur'an is a disbeliever. Look what he did he say, Abu Uthman ibn Haddad, what did he say? Jami'u man intaha la tawheeda. Everybody who has monotheism, la ilaha illallah with them. This is not even a, ya akhi, brailvis believe the Qur'an is preserved. This is an ijma'ah, this is not, the Obandis believe the Qur'an is preserved. Sah? This is mun'aqid, qarnan ba'da qarnin, this Qur'an is preserved. It's nothing, pay attention to this. So everybody who has tawheed, even those who don't have tawheed, like the brailvis and others, believe it. فما هلكم من منع معه التوحيد؟ they all متفقون على أن من جحد حب حرف anyone who just جحود which is stubbornness towards what a letter a letter من القرآن كفر أما هي كفر هي كفلين كفر هي he's going to bring many many points هي just letters we're not forget words forget words letter lam lam I think Islam is extra from the Quran كفر not one letter of this Qur'an that we have today is extra. And not one letter is missing. It's preserved. Allah said in the Qur'an, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna, wa inna lahu lahafidhul. We're going to protect it. It's a promise from Allah. This Qur'an is preserved. Naam. Wa qadi tafaqa fuqahai baghdad hai. Listen to this story, okay? This one, listen to this man, Ibn Shambud, what happened to him. In providing a context for the above facts, Al-Qadi Iyad reports the following. In 323 Anil Hijrah, the jurists of Baghdad unanimously agreed and decreed that Ibn Shambul al-Mukri, al-Mukri means the reciter, one of the leading reciters of his time along with Ibn Mujahid, must announce his repentance for reciting and teaching others to recite obscure and ill-narrated readings of the Quran. Ibn Shambul who was from the, one of the Qurra al-Kibar who used to do Qira'at with Ibn Mujahid, he used to do with Ibn Mujahid. Ibn Mujahid, you know who he is, right? Yeah? Who is he? Yeah? Sa'id ibn, this is not Mujahid ibn Jabril. This is not Mujahid ibn Jabril. Ibn Mujahid is the person who coined the Sab'a, Sab'a Qira'at. That's where it originally came from. The, the, the Quranic dialects, he, he's the one who restricted it to seven. Are you there, brothers? He's the first person who did it, and then after him, everybody came and they worked on it. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about this in more detail. Ibn Mujahid, Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid, his name's called. Are you there, brothers? He's got a book called as Sabah. He and this individual, Ibn Shambud, both used to be Qurra together in, in Baghdad. They used to do Qiraat. This, this person, Ibn Shambud, he did something. That the fuqaha and the jurists of Baghdad had to creed to request from him to repent. Istitaba. It's called Majlisul Istitaba. He was requested openly to repent from his mistake and his error. Are you? The reason why, look what he did. What was the reason why he was asked this? They, the jurists of Baghdad, therefore ruled that he desist and announced his repentance and documented the ruling whereby he testified to his actions in the presence of Minister Abu Ali ibn Mukla in the year 323 Anno Hijri. Abu Muhammad ibn Abu Zayd once ruled that an individual... Ah, he jumped something, you see? He just translated. The thing that he was creed for was what? Liqira'ati wa iqira'i. He was studying... So he was reading, sorry. And he was teaching the qira'at which was shahidda. From the letters which are not in the mushaf. He was reading that. So they requested from him to repent from that and to come back from what he did. Ya Akhi, this man was reading the Qira'ah which is Shad. He's not even saying that the Quran is distorted or the, is the letter missing or not. He's not doing any of that. So he was requested to do what? He was, and not only they documented the, the, the repentance, they actually documented his repentance. They writ it. Now. Abu Muhammad ibn Abu Zayd once ruled that an individual who says to a child, 
May Allah curse your teacher and that which he teaches you. Look, he says, a person says, a person says to a person, May Allah curse you. So may Allah curse your teacher and what he taught you. Yeah. And then retracts by explaining that he meant the child's misbehavior and not the Quran is to be disciplined. So if that person says, no, Allah, you know what I said that? You know what I said that? I actually meant he, may your teacher be cursed for teaching you these bad manners. And may you, his disrespect that he taught you also be cursed. That's what I meant. He will be whipped. Or he would be mannered, disciplined, in whatever form, shape is needed. Okay. A person cursing the Mus'haf, however, must be executed. He should be killed, he said. If the person, that's what he said. Who does it? The Muslim leader does that. The Muslim leader does that, not general mass. This is the end of Qadi Iyad's quote. So it's finished now from the Kitab al-Shifa. Section. It is prohibited to interpret the Qur'an without knowledge or speak of its meanings without being qualified to do so. There is plenty of proof, print this, there is plenty of proof for this from the sayings of the Prophet and it is something that the scholars have agreed upon. It is, however, permissible and praiseworthy for scholars to interpret the Qur'an, and this is also something the scholars have agreed upon. Scholars who are therefore qualified to interpret and possess the necessary tools and equipment that will help them to understand the Qur'an's meanings and are, at least, relatively sure of what those meanings are, are allowed to interpret the Qur'an and the meanings in question. Uh, uh, Sorry, are allowed to interpret the Qur'an if the meanings in question are those which can be deduced through ishtihad, which is reasoned judgment. Such meanings include, for instance, meanings and rulings that are both hidden and obvious rulings, as well as that which is general and specific, grammatical categorizations, and so on and so forth. If, however, the meanings in question are those that cannot be derived through ishtihad, reasoned judgment, such as that which may only be interpreted by what has been transmitted to us, or through the linguistic interpretation of certain words, it is not permissible for the scholar to make interpretations unless they are transmitted from reliable and trustworthy sources who are qualified to make those initial judgments regarding that, that in which is questioned. If the scholar does not have the necessary tools required to interpret the Qur'an and is not qualified to do so, it is prohibited that he tried to interpret it of his own accord, but it is permitted for him to relay the interpretations of those before him or those who are qualified. Those who interpret the Qur'an by way of mere opinion, without referring to authentic proof, fall under different categories. Among them are those who interpret verses so that the meanings corroborate their chosen school of thought and their own views in spite of the fact that the interpreter is not even reasonably sure that the verses in question mean what he claims, and rather only seeks to disprove his opponent's views. The second of these categories includes those who mean well and wish to call others to that which is good, but they do so by interpreting verses in a manner that does not, shock, that, does not suggest that which it is initially meant. The third category is that of those who interpret the Arabic terms of the Qur'an without referring to and adhering to the meanings given to such terms by the original native Arabic speakers. Such original meanings can only be learned through direct transmission from scholars of the Arabic language and scholars of the Qur'anic interpretation. Among the things which may only be learned in this manner are the meanings of a term, its grammatical function, that which it is meant but not stated, and that which has been shortened, that which, is, that which contains pronouns, apparent meanings, symbolic meanings, that which applies in general, and that which is specific to certain instances, that which is broad and that which requires qualification, that which has been placed before its typical position in a sentence, and that which has been stated later than its typical position as well as other things that may not be apparent at first glance. Knowledge of the Arabic language alone is insufficient with regards to properly understanding, understanding the Qur'an. Allahu Akbar. في ذلك معرفة العربية وحدها. Just to know the Arabic language is not enough to do tafsir of the Qur'an. بل لا بد what is necessary is what? معها من معرفة ما قاله أهل التفسير فيها. You have to have نقل. The أقوال of the تابعين and the تابع تابعين and others. 
So this is another statement transmitted from who? Al Imam al Nawi. So it is not enough that a person knows the Arabic language and is good at linguistics and in Arabic linguistics and is looking at words like that. That is not enough for him to comment on the Quran. Rather, what is needed from him is he has to know what the people of Tafsir said. Ahlul Nakli wal Riwaya. So he has to know what Mujahid ibn Jabri said, Ibn Jarir al Tabari said, and others. What is she doing? She's trying to get somebody's mobile phone. She goes crazy when she's in the mission more than when she's at home. Okay. <laughs> Knowledge of the Arabic language alone is insufficient with regards to properly understanding the Qur'an. It is therefore necessary that one be well versed in the statements of the scholars of interpretation on the different verses and issues pertaining to the Qur'an. This is also important because the scholars may, with regards to a particular verse, be agreed upon discarding the apparent meaning of the verse or upon its application to specific instances only, or upon it to contain hidden pronouns, that which will significantly change its apparent meaning, or anything else that causes the verse to be interpreted in a manner contrary to its apparent obvious meaning. This is also significant as a, as a particular word may carry more than one meaning, with only one of those meanings intended in particular. A person unaware of this fact may fall into interpreting a in, A person unaware of this fact may also fall into interpreting a word in accordance with all its different linguistic definitions and meanings, and not restrict himself to the intended meaning of the word. All of the above forms of interpreting the Quran are prohibited, and Allah knows best. Section. To argue and dispute over the meanings of the Quran without due cause is impermissible. An example of such impermissible arguing is when one sees that the meaning of a given verse lies contrary to the view of his school of thought on a given matter. So a person holds an opinion and he realizes that this verse goes against his opinion. It's been brought to him. Somebody and him are having a dialogue. They bring to his attention that what he's saying goes against the verse. So your madhab and your belief right now goes against the verse. But he just wants to argue his point. And he knows he's going against an ayah. Instead of saying, you know what, A'udhu Billah, let me double check this. You brought me a valid point. I need to go back and, and inshaAllah ta'ala revise my position in this issue then. But he just persistently goes on. So this is, for, this is one of the prohibited types of debating in the Qur'an. Naam. An example of such impermissible debating is when one sees that the meaning of a given verse lies contrary to the view of his school of thought on a given matter, or that it provides only weak evidence for his opinion. So he, takes a, he makes a madhab, and he bases his madhab on a very weak argument. On a very weak argument. And then he forces that weak argument to be in accordance to his madhab. And you can see the dalala and the way he's trying to extract the evidences is that he's breaking the necks of the evidences and forcing the evidence to turn towards his direction. He's overworking the evidences. No. And so begins to interpret it to support his chosen stance, in spite of the fact that he knows it doesn't support it at all. He knows that it is against him. Those who genuinely do not see that the verse lies contrary to what they say, however, are excused from using it to support their standpoint. It is authentically stated that the Prophet wasallam said, to argue regarding the Qur'an is kufr or heresy. Regarding the word argument in the above hadith, Al Khattab explains what is meant by argument. And by argument he means to have doubt. It has also been explained to mean that argument causes doubt. A third explanation is that it means that which people of whims and desires delve into when they interpret verses that deal with destiny and other such issues in accordance to their, to their own unfounded beliefs. Mm -hmm section. Those who seek to inquire about the placement of one verse before another, for instance, or wish to know the context of a verse in, particular, in a particular place, are to ask 
what the wisdom is behind such matters. Naam. If a person wants to ask, a, 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 he wants to ask something pertaining to the Qur'an. So for example, he wants to say, why is this before this one? What is the reason? Or he wants to ask the relationship between the verses. He wants to ask that. The way he should ask that question is by saying, مَالْحِكْمَةُ فِي كَدَى What's the wisdom in this? That's what he should say. That's how you should present your question. You should say, مَالْحِكْمَةُ What is the wisdom in this matter? That's how you should present your question. Naam. Section. It is disliked that one say that he has forgotten such and such verse. Some people say, Oh no, I forgot that verse. You shouldn't say I forgot. You should never say I forgot that verse. You shouldn't use the word I forgot. So what should you say? He'll tell you what to say. But rather, he should say that he was made to forget it. So that's what you should say. He should made to forget it. The person should say, I was, I was made to forget it. No. It is reported in the two authentic books, Bukhari and Muslim, that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, None of you should say, I have forgot such and such verse. Rather, he was made to forget it. The same hadith is also narrated in, two, in the two authentic books, but with different wording. In one, it is despised that one of you say, I have forgotten such and such verse. <coughs> Rather, he was made to forget it. No. It is also reported in, in the two authentic books that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated that the Prophet heard a man reciting and then said, He has reminded me of a verse which I was made to drop, meaning made to forget. In another narration of the same hadith, in Al Bukhari, he said, I was made to forget. So the Prophet said this, alayhi salatu salam. No. That which Ibn Abu Dawood narrated from Abu Abdurrahman al-Sulami, as 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 a renowned tabi'i, who stated, Do not say I dropped, meaning to forget. Say such and such verse, but say I was made to neglect or overlook it. So you should use those words. I was made to basically overlook this verse or forget this verse or uh, to neglect this verse, I was made. Don't put it, don't say I forgot, or I neglected, or I overlooked. Don't say that. And this shows you also that the Prophet is a human being. He also forgets things, just like we do. As he said about himself, He reminded me of an ayatun kuntu asqatuha. He reminded me of a verse in which I was made to what? I was made to forget. Naam. But that doesn't mean that the Prophet ﷺ forgot the Quran in totality. Yeah? He didn't. But what it means is that he alayhi salatu wasalam sometimes would forget something and somebody would remind him. And he also even mentioned alayhi salatu wasalam that he said that two people may come to me. One is more eloquent in his argument than the other. And I might fall for the one who is eloquent and give him what isn't his rights. And then the Prophet said, fear Allah in what you take. Fear Allah in what you take. For verily what you've taken is a portion of the nar. So we don't believe like the Christians believe about Nabi Allah Muhammad. We don't believe that he's a ilah. We don't believe he's God. We believe he's a human being. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he's not an ordinary human being. He's a what? He's a noble Prophet of Allah. Alayhi salatu wasalam, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. First one, hey, section. Hey. Yeah? I haven't read it. فصل في حكم تسمية السورة يجوز أن يقال سورة البقرة وسورة آل عمران وسورة النساء وسورة المائدة وسورة الأنعام وكذا الباقي ولا كراهة في ذلك وكري بعض المتقدمين هذا وقالوا يقال السورة التي تذكر فيها البقرة وسورة التي يذكر فيها آل عمران وسورة التي يذكر فيها النساء وكذلك الباقي والصواب الأول فقد ثبت في الصحيحين عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قوله 
سورة البقرة وسورة الكهف وغيرهما مما لا يحصى وكذلك عن الصحابة رضي الله عنهم قال ابن مسعود هذا مقام الذي أنزلت عليه سورة البقرة وعنه في الصحيحين قرأت على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم سورة النساء والأحاديث وأقوال السلف في هذا كثيرة من أن تحجر وفي السورة لغتان الهمز وترك, وترك أفصح وهو الذي جاء به القرآن وممن ذكر لغتين ابن قتيبة في غريب الحديث Section. It is permissible to name the chapters by calling them Surah Al-Baqarah, Baqarah, or Surah Al-Ali Imran, or Surah Al-Nisa, and likewise the rest of the chapters, and this is not something that is disliked. Some of those among the early generations, however, did dislike this and suggested that one say the chapter in which the cow is mentioned, or the chapter in which Al-Ali uh, Imran is mentioned, or the chapter in which the women are mentioned. Some scholars, there's two opinions regarding can you name a surah and call it, for example, Surah Al Baqarah? Or can you say Surah Al Imran? Or can you say Surah Al Nisa? Or can you say Surah Al Ma'idah? Surah Al An'am? Can you say that? Some scholars they said, yeah, you can. Why? What's the problem? Another group of scholars said, yes, there is a problem. What you should say is, what you should say is the surah in which the cow was mentioned, the surah in which Al Imran was mentioned, and the surah which the surah which the cattle was mentioned, Surah to Al Imran and Surah Al Nisa. You should say it like that. And there are seven surahs from the Quran, counting Surah Al Baqarah onwards. Seven surahs. Let's count them Baqarah, Al Imran, Surah Al Nisa, Surah Al Ma'idah, Surah Al An'am, Surah Al A'raf, and Surah Al Al Fal, right? Seven, seven surahs. These are called Sab Atiwal. Sab Atiwal means the seven lengthy surahs in the Quran. They're the longest seven surahs in the Quran. Are you with me, brothers? The Messenger said, anyone who memorizes them, who understands what's in them, he is a scholar. The Prophet said, he is a habr. Sab Atiwal. Anyone who memorizes these seven surahs, he knows what's in it, the meanings of every single verse in there. He knows it. The Messenger alayhi salatu was salam, he said he is a habr. Habr. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah authenticated this. So these surahs are called the sab'a tiwal, the seven lengthy surahs. And from those surahs is Baqarah, Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah Al-An'am, Sah, and Surah Al-A'raf, and Surah Al-Anfal.